as we begin our service of worship, I invite you to join me in the call to worship, the words you will see on the screen. We need your presence on the long road, Lord, the road between fear and hope, the road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we are in need of your company. Jesus, stand among us in thy risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. Good morning and welcome to Central United Methodist Church on this second Sunday after Easter. Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age. We're going to be singing those words and others in our opening hymn this morning. As we sing together, Christ is alive. Let's join our voices now. Even though we may be far apart, let us once again unite our minds and hearts together as we share what it is we believe as a community of faith using this morning the traditional version of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm together saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have promised to meet those who seek your face. Come now 
and reveal your presence to us as we make ourselves present to you. Bless this time of worship in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a joy to be in worship together this day as we celebrate our risen Savior. I have several announcements that I need to share with you this day. One is a celebration at the birth of Elizabeth Lovinggood Neal. Elizabeth is the daughter of Sally and Ben Neal and the granddaughter of Beth and John Adams. Even as we celebrate their birth, we also grieve with families in our congregation who have lost loved ones recently. We lift up Jerome and Catherine Hollingsworth and Sarah Gilliland at the death of Sarah and Jerome's brother, Marlon. We remember Lee and Rachel Vaught and their family at the death of Lee's mother, Barbara. We remember Mike and Kathy Vickery at the death of Mike's mother, Gail. And we remember Jim and Jimmy Pruitt at the death of Jimmy's niece, Marquis Arnold. Please keep all of these families in your prayers. We want everyone to stay safe as we continue this time of quarantine. If you need a mask, some of the ladies in the church have been making masks and we thank them so very much for this. There are some masks available in the fountain area here at the church if you are able to come by. If you need a mask delivered to you, please give one of the pastors or Carolyn Dobson a call and we'll be happy to make sure that you get that mask that you need. If you have materials to contribute to make masks, there is also a bin in the fountain area or we can pick up those materials if you would give us a call. Need a bit of encouragement as this quarantine continues? Several of the ministers in our area who grew up here at Central have sent words of encouragement to us in the form of videos that you can find on Facebook, Instagram, and through our website, centralunitedmethodistchurch.com. I encourage you to look for those. Melissa Self Patrick, and Wade Griffith have posted videos. We also have a video on its way from Andrew and Peyton Winsler. Classes continue via Zoom and Facebook. We encourage you to be a part of those. If you need the information for how to con connect with those classes, I encourage you to look for that on our uh, website, centralunitedmethodist.com or give a call to one of your group leaders or to a staff member. Finally, let me encourage you and thank you. You have been wonderful in continuing your giving to God and to the church. This is necessary as expenses continue, even though we're not able to be together in person. So if you would continue your giving, we would be most grateful for that. You can give online on the church website. You can make an arrangement with your bank to send a bank draft, or you can mail your check in to the church office. We thank you for continuing to support the ministries of the church because the ministries continue even when we're not able to be together. Hello and good morning. My name is John White and I'm honored to be with you today to share some thoughts and feelings on what a truly special place Central United Methodist Church is to my family and me. 
You know, over these last few weeks at home, we've had plenty of time to sit back and reflect on the people and things in our life that are important, the things that we miss. I don't know about each of you, I certainly will never take for granted the ability to go get a haircut again after all this. But in all seriousness, my church family definitely ranks very highly on that list. I sure miss that time together on Sunday mornings, time to be together for worship and fellowship, the smiles, the warm handshakes, the hugs that are exchanged during greeting time. I miss that so very much. I look forward to the day, hopefully sooner rather than later, that we can all be together to do that very thing again. You know, as I was collecting my thoughts and trying to come up with the words to express just what Central means to me, it became apparent very quickly that really there are no words. Just a lot of very strong, powerful feelings and emotions tied to great memories and such incredible friendships that have been forged over these last 15 years at Central. You know, as much as we miss being together and we miss that building that stands at 616 Jackson Street, that is not Central United Methodist Church. You guys are central. You are the living, breathing body of Christ out there in the community every single day making a difference, helping people, and spreading God's word. You're out there doing just as you were commanded to do, and I'm so proud to be part of this congregation. Chastity and I were discussing our first visit to Central, and just, you know, we we're still to this day struck by how warm the welcome was. We were, were greeted like family. And people just went out of their way to come walk up to us, to come invite us to come visit a Sunday school class, come to an upcoming church event, Wednesday night suppers. And of course, the topper was a visit from the incredible Linda Peake, who just in her own special way made us feel so welcome. Uh, We knew that we had found our spiritual home whenever we, we came to visit Central. Um, You know, looking back over the last 15 years in terms of our daily life, there really is no aspect of that that hasn't been impacted in a significant way by relationships formed at Central. Whether we're talking about Central Weekday School, you know, Eliza and Vivi still to this day think Miss Donna hung the moon. We think about the children's program and the great work that Debbie does there, laying that foundation. And then David and Rosie for working with our youth and helping them to really discover and grow in their faith. It's so important to her, the future of our church. I think about Sunday school classes and the way that Lynn and Carol Ozier for a lot of years were like second parents to a huge group of young couples in this church. I think about Bible studies and small groups and just the the way that those more intimate settings really allow for deep relationships to be formed. Our church is blessed with so many great people and I I could name them all (laughs) and be here all day. I do have to say that uh, Suzanne Waller, Beth Adams, Yvonne McCord, Charlotte White, just to name a few, uh, our church is blessed with so many incredible people. We give thanks for each and every one of you for the way that you've welcomed us, you've enriched our lives, and we we just give thanks for each of each of you because you're incredible. <clears throat> when I think about the impact of Central on the community, um, you know I'm just so proud. There's no charitable organization that doesn't have some involvement from Central. Uh, Anytime there's a need that is brought up, the people just spring into action and it gets done. And I'm so proud and, and thankful for that. In closing, I would just like to say, we love you, we miss you, we look forward to the day that we're all together again. But in the meantime, we pray God's blessings for you and pray that you will all be well. Good morning. As you can see, I wear glasses, and I know some of you do as well. I wear glasses so I can actually see things better. Otherwise, I can't read words in a book very well or see you very well. And my story today is about a little boy who also can't see very well. His name is Emmett. Well, What's neat about Emmett is he didn't realize that he couldn't see very well. And the funny thing is, nobody else realized it either. You see, Emmett thought everything in the world had fuzzy edges because that's how everything looked to him. And he thought everyone else saw things just like him. Well, his parents soon noticed that he sat very close to the TV when he was watching it, or that he held his book right up in his face when he was reading. 
They realized Emmett must need glasses. So they took him to the doctor, and sure enough, soon he had a brand new pair of glasses, and he was worried about what his friends might think when he was wearing them. Well, soon as he put those glasses on, all of his worries vanished because, oh my gosh, he could see clearly the world wasn't fuzzy. He saw leaves on the trees. He saw that he could read his book without it being right in his face. He could see his mama's face clearly from across the room. Emmett could see the world clearly now. Well, you may not have trouble with your eyesight, but all of us have trouble seeing things and understanding things throughout our life. Well, our Bible story today takes place three days after Jesus was crucified. And it tells us how some of Jesus' disciples had trouble understanding what they had seen. After he had died, his, his disciples were so sad. They thought Jesus was gone forever, and they did not know what to do. Well, two of Jesus' friends were traveling back home after the crucifixion. And they were very sad, and they had a very long journey. They were traveling back to their village of Emmaus. And during their travels, a stranger joined them. And they didn't recognize him, but they began to tell him all the stories of Jesus. They began to tell him what had happened, what had just happened to Jesus, and why they were so very sad. Well, when they arrived at their home in Emmaus, they asked the stranger, come in and have dinner with us. It's been a long journey. And he did. He came in, he sat down with them at, at their place to eat, and when they broke bread, he prayed over it. And it was just like they had had Emma's glasses and put them on, and they could see clearly. It wasn't a stranger that was with them. It was, in fact, Jesus. The resurrected Jesus had been with them on the whole journey. He was alive. And they were so excited. As soon as Jesus left them, they ran back to Jerusalem to tell all the other disciples the great news. Jesus is alive. You know, sometimes we're confused and we don't understand what's happening. We don't see things clearly. Well, when that happens, we need someone to help us. We need someone to answer our questions, to, to help us understand what's going on. Well, Jesus is the one to do that. Jesus is with us on our journey the whole entire way. We just have to ask him. We just have to ask him for help. You see, with Jesus in our lives, with Jesus in our hearts, he will help us to understand that God loves us and is here for us and that there is nothing to fear. We need to trust in him because he will help us to make it through the good times and the bad times. He will help us to see things more clearly. Can we say a prayer? Dear God, we are so thankful that as we travel along life's road, Jesus is walking with us. Help us to trust in him and to ask him for help when we feel lost or confused. He will help us to understand and see things more clearly. Thank you for the gift of your Son in our lives. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great week.
and I hope to see you soon. Alleluia. Praise. That word is used so many times in so many different songs. Our second hymn today, Alleluia, Alleluia, number 162, might be a tune that you think in your head is one way, but is actually another. So this morning, this tune, Alleluia, Alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, give praise to His name. Might be a little bit unfamiliar, but we're going to sing all four verses, and I want you to join in as you feel comfortable. But this is a wonderful hymn to praise God and glorify Him and celebrate His resurrection as we all sing together the second hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia. <laughs> Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. Before I read these words, will you join me in our prayer? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? 
they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer the, these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, and amen. Let us pray together. O oh God of all creation, we, your children, come before you today excited about the opportunity to worship you concerned about the situation we find ourselves in and confident of your presence in our midst. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in a powerful way this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. This past week, I've heard a number of people talk about the effects of this pandemic as having an effect effect on first responders, medical personnel, and support people. And how many of these folks are described as suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? One expert in the field in particular said that he was seriously wounded about the hundreds and thousands of these people becoming victims themselves and becoming unable to function. He said this will be one of the ongoing residues of the pandemic. The truth is that any time there's a major negative event in our lives, uh, we have all have the potential to have a little PTSD. Think about your own life. Think about a time when you were stressed out or traumatized. Did that feeling linger? Now, it may not have been debilitating and it may not have been long term, but each one of us have felt it. You know, when you consider what the two disciples in our story this morning had just been through, uh, it's obvious that a sense of overwhelming grief that generally accompanies death of someone important to us filled them. Reverend, Ke Reverend Kevin Cravens Cott said, I imagine that they were experiencing some PTSD of sorts, having just seen one of their closest friends and leaders meet such a brutal death right in front of their eyes. Nothing could have prepared them for what happened. Even though Jesus had tried to tell them they weren't ready and they were lost 
and uncertain of what to do next. Now, two of the disciples left Jerusalem and they headed back home to the village of Emmaus, which is about seven miles away, a two or three hour walk. I guess they were trying to get out of the city and get away from all the horrible memories that they had. Uh, I guess they were trying to process what had happened. And I'm sure that as they walked along, they talked to each other about what had happened. Kind of like we do on a long road trip. Uh, everything gets brought up and, and you have plenty of time to go through it. They were going home. They were going home probably to go back to work since this whole Jesus is Messiah thing did not seem to have worked out all right. But one thing that does happen in these moments is their grief and their hopelessness feed off each other. You know the old saying, misery loves company. As they walked along and as they talked, it only aggravated each other's feelings. There's a term nurses use who work in hospital nurseries, and the term is social crying. One baby starts to cry, and they all start to cry. I find I've gotten to that age in my life when someone begins to complain about their physical ailments, we all then begin to share and, and feel the need to join in. And at a funeral, a lot of people are reminded of their own losses and their own feelings when someone dies. What the disciples are feeling is real, though and is shared for obvious reasons. And the last thing they needed at that moment was for someone to minimize their hurt and act as if nothing happened. Dr. Alice McKenzie says that the disciples deserve the dignity of their grief and perhaps the benefit of the doubt. So when these two disciples on the road to Emmaus encounter a stranger on that same road who asks them what they are talking about, they couldn't believe that this man didn't know, that he didn't know what had happened in Jerusalem, that he hadn't heard about all that had gone on. So they both had to share the story of what had taken place. And I envision that they shared it at the same time, talking on top of each other as we sometimes do when we get excited. They said, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and to be crucified. They talked about the great loss that they had experienced and how it was more than simply losing a friend. It was the loss of a dream. They said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have taken place. Did you catch that? Did you catch that phrase? We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. Their hope had died. When we think about it, the problem is that because of their intense grief, they had missed the hope of the empty tomb. They knew the women had gone to the tomb. They knew that they had found the tomb empty. They knew that the woman had been told by an angel that Jesus was alive. But they were in such misery that they could not process it or accept it. The cross looms large before them. At this point, the stranger rebukes them and calls them foolish and slow of heart to believe. And he begins to unfold the scriptures about the Messiah, starting with Moses and going down to the present age. And by the time they reach the village of Emmaus, the men began to beg the, the stranger to remain with them, for it was getting dark and they wanted to hear more. And the men said he would stay. And a simple meal was prepared, but when the meal was brought to the table, it was the stranger who acted as the host. And he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Do you see the parallel with the Last Supper? 
that's just happened a few days before. It's when he did that that they realized it was Jesus. And after they realized it was Jesus, he disappeared. And the men immediately headed back to Jerusalem to tell the others. Don't you know it was a completely different journey back to Jerusalem than when they were headed to Emmaus in the afternoon? Their hope and their excitement had returned, and they had to share it. One of the commentators I read this week said, The story may have meant to, been meant to reassure Luke's church, who had not seen the resurrected Lord, that he can still be walking by their side. The story is meant to reignite hope. Now, the two disciples on the road and the disciples in the upper room all missed the hope of the resurrection because of their grief and fear. And I think it raises for all of us the question, all of us who seek to follow Jesus, how long will we miss the hope? Now, all of us indeed move through dark places in times of loss and grief. But as Dr. Alice McKenzie says, I'm not talking about a dark night of the soul or a state of depression. I'm talking about the spiritual condition of habitually expecting failure and sorrow where we've been promised victory and joy. I'm not talking about waking up every morning. I am talking about waking up every morning and heading to the garden tomb looking for a corpse of walking through a valley of the shadow of death that is darker, darker than it needs to be because we closed the blinds and unscrewed the lights and the sconces in the hall. I find that to be unfortunately true of us and of the church. We let negative attitudes and petty complaints and per pervasive pessimism occupy us as we are going through trying to follow Jesus. We look for things that are wrong and we seek to stir them up. We assume the worst and seek to find fault with others and their ideas and their expressions of faithfulness. And the saddest thing that we do is that we choose to follow the voice in our head that seeks to convince us that nothing will ever change or improve. It leads us to reject without considering how God is going to use others and how God is going to use us. And when we do this, we're like those disciples on the road back to Emmaus. We're turning our back on the hope and the joy of the resurrection. Now, thankfully, the story doesn't end with the journey to Emmaus but the journey back to the upper room. The defeated words of the disciples are turned to rejoicing and excitement. When they recognize the risen Christ is standing right beside them, they can reclaim their hope. They are transformed from complainers to proclaimers, all because Christ is with them. I think we all need the reassurance of Jesus' presence with us, walking with us, and guiding us. We all need His power and His grace to turn us away from the hopeless negative talk and to turn us toward taking another step with Him into the hope. Let us pray. Oh God, You provide us hope when we surround ourselves with darkness. Oh God, You provide us grace and mercy when we bind ourselves with the difficult things we've done. Oh God, you have provided us with joy. May we receive that joy this day and give you thanks. Amen. Although our Easter service is done and we are in the second Sunday after Easter, we still celebrate that wonderful, glorious day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as we end our worship service today by joining together and singing all three verses of The Day of Resurrection.
Let us receive this blessing. May the grace of God be with you and follow you and undergird you and protect you this day and every day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.